Sometimes providing power means lending a hand. So Energy sponsors free tax return assistance and financial education to help our customers take control of their future. Together, we power life. Energy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. There's news on the election, it feels like, every day. The campaign for governor roars out of the starting blocks. I don't believe this report is very accurate. Charter schools respond to a scathing study. It produces cracks, but very, very tiny cracks. These cracks actually can self-heal. Bendable concrete takes steps toward real-world use. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Moro. Much more on those stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, a look at other headlines across Louisiana. Governor John Bell Edwards this week announced plans to designate more than $350 million, including $55 million from fiscal year 2018 surplus dollars, to Louisiana's Coastal Trust Fund. Within those surplus dollars, $15 million will go to restore money used by the previous administration. The governor says under his watch, coastal dollars will be used for coastal projects. The call is going out for volunteers to plant bald cypress trees Saturday, February 2nd at the pointe aux Chant Wildlife Management Area in Terrebonne Parish. America's Wetland Foundation and others are hosting this event. The volunteer planting will complete the restoration of this historic cypress forest. To register to volunteer, go to info at americaswetland.com. ExxonMobil says uncertainty surrounding the state industrial tax exemption program could hurt future spending at Baton Rouge plants. The oil giant is withdrawing its pending 2017 ITEP requests, which the EBR Parish School Board recently rejected. The company says Baton Rouge treats companies inconsistently, but it wanted the tax break to continue for projects already completed. Louisiana has some of the nation's worst crime statistics, but five cities stand apart as the safest in the state. Gretna, on the west bank of New Orleans, ranks first, followed by Mandeville, Youngsville, Covington, and Minden. FBI uniform crime statistics are used to make up the study in cities with a minimum population of 10,000 people. Delta Kappa Epsilon, DEEK, has closed its nearly century-old chapter at LSU over violations of the fraternity's alcohol and hazing policies. The national chapter made the decision after an investigation. LSU is investigating as well. The university is cracking down on unsafe fraternity and sorority practices following the 2017 hazing death of pledge Max Groover at another campus fraternity. A state Board of Regents survey finds that college freshmen admitted without meeting its minimum standards had lower grades and were less likely to graduate than those who reached the admission criteria. The survey also found that two-thirds of those admitted by exception in 2016 returned for classes in 2017, compared to 82 percent who had met minimum standards. Well, this week, the governor's race ramped up with candidate websites going online and campaigning really underway. There are three in the race right now, Democrat John Bell Edwards going for re-election and GOP challengers Eddie Rispone and U.S. Representative Ralph Abraham. I talked with two of the state's top journalists. They've been on the campaign trail. Here to talk about the campaign, Elizabeth Crisp from the Advocate newspaper, Greg Hilburn from the USA Today Network newspapers. Of the three, Governor Edwards also rolled out a three-minute video. Let's take a look at how that video begins. Three years ago when you elected me, I promised that as your governor, I would put Louisiana first. Your families, jobs, businesses, health care, 
and our children's education would be my top priorities. I've kept that promise. And as a result, Louisiana is moving in the right direction. Now, he talks about his accomplishments, his goals, but was quickly met with pushback. And that's a nice way of saying it from the other candidates, uh, Ralph Abraham in particular. Uh, The words are coming out really hard right off the bat, aren't they? From zero to 60. You know, it's it's only January. We still have several months until Election Day, but already this this campaign cycle is just quickly, rapid, rapidly snowballing to the point where there's news on the election, it feels like, every day. Well, there's news that we haven't even heard from. A lot of the negative comments, as I mentioned, uh, Ralph Abraham's group um, saying that Edwards has uh, done a bad job. But Abraham has also received a lot of criticism about the salary story and his taking a salary or not taking a salary. That salary, that's something you've covered, Greg. It was an issue that came up uh, this week and he had made it a pledge when he first ran for Congress six or seven years ago that uh, he would not take a salary. And he, I think his quote was that people shouldn't have to pay for representation. And according to him and his campaign, the congressman didn't take a salary for his first term, you know, which is about 174 or $5,000 a year donated most of that to St. Jude, but he began taking a salary in the next two terms. Uh, he said because he didn't realize that he wasn't going to be able to continue his income from his medical practice, which is forbidden uh, once you get to Congress. So, uh, which I think uh, people could understand, but some people I think would have liked for him to announce that and say, you know, I, and explain why he was now going to start taking the check that he was earning by working in Congress. Yeah, some people have blown up with that story, though. But, Elizabeth, you kind of think it's really a non-story. I just, I personally, I don't know that that story on its own is going to really change anybody's votes um, in this race. But I do think that we're starting to see um, a bit of where this election is going to go um, in terms of in terms of a narrative. Um, if you noticed from that, the governor's opening uh, Yes. Pitch, he mentioned, you know, keeping promises. It sounds like, based on um, all of the negative uh, attention with uh, the Abraham story, that there was really this narrative being set up of he didn't keep a promise. Even, you know, there's there's some subjectiveness there if, he, you know, he says he did keep it for that one term and all of that. But it does seem like that is kind of the narrative that is starting to. Uh, be built sure. right now. Eddie Responi, of course, uh, he says he's running because he couldn't imagine another four years of Edwards politics. Your reaction to that? Well, um, he's been really quiet. He's been the quiet one so far, although he's uh, he announced early, one of the earliest to announce. And each have campaign websites. That, you can right, they do. donate, look at that, look at their agenda, look at what they stand for. Absolutely. But he has not, he's not been out in the public much. He hadn't given too many interviews. Elizabeth, I, I know last week, went to a meet and greet and was one of the, it's one of the first times I think there's that, that she's been reported on him. He's doing a lot of these more kind of meet and greets, a lot quieter. Um, I went to uh, the Southern Republican Legislature Uh, leadership conference um, over the weekend in Kenner and he was there working the room chatting people up and all of that Um, so I think that part of it is just he's a different kind of candidate you know um, Governor Edwards and Congressman Abraham both have experience with this they both run campaigns they both um, you know deal with the media regularly and all of that Um, Eddie Responi is portraying himself as a businessman who is, you know, an outsider candidate. And um, it really does seem like that's the kind of race that we're seeing from him right now. All right. So you guys have covered political campaigns before, of course, and you're really hot on this campaign right now, uh, the race for governor. What are you hearing from people out in the communities and in the cities that you talk to and where you go? Well, used to, uh, the rule was, you know, you didn't become engaged in these races until like Labor Day. I don't think that's the case anymore, not with social media, uh, of which I've said on this show before, of which I've been tutored by Elizabeth on. But I mean, it's on right away. You know, it's it, it's on from from now, from jump. A lot of tweets and, coming out from the Democratic Party, a lot of uh, tweets from, from the Republicans. By, right, all over each other. And so um, Mr. Responi hadn't yet gotten into that fray, but I'm sure his team's gearing up to, to join the fray. Mm-hmm. 
Are you surprised that Edwards is the only one that had a video message, for example, on his website? I think that, you know, the governor has, um, from when he first took office, he has used this technique quite a bit, pretty mm -hmm. effectively. I mean, it's a simple technique, um, though, and it gives yeah. people a chance to hear you <laughs> right. and see you talk. Yeah. I think that the governor is is very obviously very comfortable doing that, um, and he's used it quite a bit. I think we'll have to see the other the other two candidates how um, they decide if they want to kind of go the same yeah. track or not. Um, well, eventually they will yeah. with, with TV commercials. <laughs> you know, I, I think that everybody wondered if Senator Kennedy was going to get in the race until right. he announced that he wouldn't. I think we would definitely have seen him <laughs> because he's somebody who is very I comfortable on camera. So. Um, Let's I talk war chest yeah. very quickly. Who's got money, who may <laughs> not have as much as they need, and uh, start with that. Well, the governor's going to have as much as he needs. I, his team has said they'll report $8.3 in the February, the next, the next reporting date, which is in February. Mr. Responi said he's going to put $5 million of his own money, at least $5 million of right. his own money, uh, his own fortune into the race. And uh, Congressman Abraham, while actively fundraising, obviously heavily, he started, you know, he started late. So he started with, f with from zero. So he's got a, he's he's, you know, he's in full campaign mode, raising money. And there's nobody else that appears to be jumping in. It's still open to do that if they want. But at this point, the way it's begun and begun very quickly and hotly, it would be feel like they were really behind the gun if they. Yeah, we've heard, you know, other names, um, former Congressman John Fleming, uh, State Senator Sharon Hewitt. But really, as hard hitting as this campaign is already going, if somebody's not announced yet, I mean, they have maybe a couple of weeks <laughs> to, right. to make the to finally because you already have so many people um, who are picking their sides you know the Republicans are dividing up um, you and know it's not something you want to play catch up on no. ever <laughs> I, I can't, it's not not my quote but I can't remember who I can't to credit for it but it's getting late early yeah, yeah. so <laughs> absolutely and, and as we said it's getting hot we're going to talk about it as uh, the months go by and as the weeks go by. Thanks for being here oh, thank to you talk all. about it here off the I beginning. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for thanks having us. A recent report about the state's charter schools is raising questions about them. The report comes from the League of Women Voters. It said charters need more oversight, that their growth, 84,000 students now, that's up from 18,000 12 years ago, that the growth is a concern, that they are competing for dollars that would typically go to public schools. Caroline Romer is executive director of the State Association of Charter Schools and here to discuss, Caroline, do charter schools take money away from public schools and money that should go to them? Sure. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Um, charter schools are um, definitely a point of contention with a lot of people, so this opportunity is great. Charter schools, let's first be clear, charter schools are public schools. They just happen not to be operated as the same in the same way that traditional public schools are. So are they receiving public dollars that may otherwise go to another type of public school? Yes, they Briefly, do. Briefly, what confuses people about the way they are operated and the way that's different than a traditional public sure. school? Sure. I think right off the top is are they public or not? They are public schools, but they are overseen by their own nonprofit board. So unlike a traditional school system that has a superintendent an elected school board that's directing that superintendent charter schools or public schools that have a nonprofit board that is directing what goes on inside that school. That's the biggest difference, along with the fact that no one's assigned to a charter school. Charter schools are schools of choice, so p parents have chosen to be there versus have been assigned there based on where they live. Well, this report is questioning the makeup of boards and also saying that school operations need more transparency. How would you respond to that? I think transparency is good, and I do think we can do better on that. I would not disagree that there is more work that can be done to bring transparency. Charter schools are written into our law, and that law specifically talks about the purpose of charter schools is to innovate around how we deliver on education to kids. We believe one of those innovations is in that governance piece. These governing bodies, how they do work, how they make decisions close to 
university students. And I do think we can do more, but there are very specific laws in place. These are public bodies. So we follow public meeting law, public budget law, bid laws. Like there are certain things that we must follow, nepotism law, ethic law. There's lots of laws there. So it's a matter of how well are schools following those laws, and are there more things we can do to bring that word transparency to the forefront? All right, now backers of charter schools say that they offer parents another option in a state that is known for low public school performance. Yeah, just today I believe um, there was a report out stating that Louisiana is not doing very well as it relates to education. I think it says something to the effect we're one of the most undereducated places. The concept behind charter schools around the scholarship or voucher program choice in general is that if we bring more options to the table for parents making decisions on behalf of their students that we can drive better results. There's more accountability um, through parents using their feet, if you will, along with that alignment of policies that set up um, standards around academics, finance, and governance. Now I understand there are some charter schools that are set to close. Yes. Uh, fairly soon, is that correct? Yes. So, and why um, is that? Well, I think an important thing to recognize, charter means a contract. So a charter school has a contract with either their local school board or the State Board of Education, and that contract is for a specific amount of time that's outlined in law. Once you reach the end of your charter or your contract, the school board is to review the results and determine if you've met the standards they've set for you inside that contract. Unfortunately, we have some schools, very recently in this case, at the State Board of Education who did not meet the terms of their contract. And so what Bessie determines to do there is say, you don't get this privilege anymore. Okay, let me ask you this. Can charter schools and traditional public schools, both being public but different, can they coexist in harmony? Yes, and they do in some places, and that's what we're working towards. The idea is... But this report would indicate that they don't. This report indicates that they feel there are a lot of questions and problems with it. I don't believe this report is very accurate in some of the information it gives, nor is it accurate, in my opinion, on what the true... Um, um, tensions might be, I, I think we could have done better in this report. Is it wrong that they're questioning things? I'm all for that. But I believe that charters can be a tool used by districts to improve results and outcomes for families. I don't think it means that a district has to be 100% charter. I don't believe that every charter is going to be successful, but I do believe that if we create more opportunities to make decisions as close to students as possible, empowering parents to decide where their students should go, along with an accountability system that holds the highest standards and expectations, we can create better academic results, and I believe charters can be a role in a district to it do It sounds that. like there's more that we can talk about on this topic. Always. And maybe bring more people in on the discussion. I'd love it. Caroline, it would be great. thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It. In the upcoming legislative session, the governor will push for a pay increase for teachers and for support staff. This month's Louisiana Public Square episode, The Value of Teachers, goes in depth on those plans. Here's an excerpt. The governor has made a very strong commitment that he will propose a $1,000 across the board pay raise for teachers, $500 across the board for support employees. I was in a meeting with him today and he is committed to making sure that that money is in his executive budget. Regardless of what happens with you know, the, the, the talk and the debate about the revenue estimating and so forth, he will definitely have that in his executive budget. Should it be a flat across the board pay raise or should there be some structure to the pay raise maybe giving extra weight to uh, for instance, special ed teachers or younger teachers coming out of school to try to lure them into the profession. Uh, now, perhaps the governor uh, should be looking at that type of an approach rather than just say, oh, we're going to give it across the board of $1,000. Maybe it ought to be $1,200, but maybe some of those special weighted areas get a little bit more as a percentage than the regular, uh, the regular uh, teachers. If you look at what uh, our teachers were paid in 1994 throughout the, the nation, 
uh, the Economic Policy Institute has those numbers, and they estimated that we were being paid about 2% less than other similarly educated professionals. In 2015, <coughs> the numbers show that we're being paid 17% less, and that's probably a greater difference today. So we, ha we can't, or we aren't, actually keeping up with the salaries that are being paid to other professionals similar to our uh, educational level. Whenever you look back at what the legislature had done, and over the years they've given teacher pay raises and they've done it in several fashions. Number one was a flat pay raise. Number two, when you look at 2013 when they did a supplement and it was based on the relative wealth of the individual districts and then it was incorporated into the MFP so that those raises could be maintained. And I think you have to look at the various scenarios and determine what is the way, best way to impact the profession and to bring in people who want to get into education. Louisiana spends $12,000 plus per child, $2,000 more than the, most, than the average southern state, and yet our results are dead last. They just came out again recently, uh, Ed Weeks published uh, in the last few weeks, that we are literally dead last in the South. Uh, one has to, as a legislature, one has to ask if we're spending so much. Now, some of it's the old UAL, we know that. That's the retirement. The yeah, old right. retirement fan. But that doesn't equal that differential. That's a piece of it. So if we're spending this much money, and our teachers, who are our number one most uh, priority as far as getting quality education are not getting paid at the right level, Legislators have to ask, what, where's the money going? What's happening to <clears> it? The value of teachers re-airs this Sunday at 11 a.m. You can also view additional interview sound bites and the entire program online at lpb.org slash public square. A fifth grade teacher from Baines Elementary in West Feliciana Parish won the Oscar of Education this week. The Milken Educator Award goes to Stephanie Whetstone. And there she is, Stephanie Whetstone got a standing ovation at this school assembly, winning the Milken Award and the $25,000 prize that goes along with it. Now the assembly celebrated the school's stellar math program. Next week here on SWI, we're gonna show you the foundation for this program and what they can teach to other schools. That's February 2nd, next week on SWI. Well, there's still a lot of testing to do, but a bendable concrete, that's right, you heard that right, that LSU researchers are developing could ultimately reshape roads and highways. LPB's Charles Jones has the report. When Gabriel Arce, Senior Research Associate with LSU's Department of Construction Management, discovered research done to create a bendable concrete, he knew just how special and important this product could be. One of the uh, in interesting things about this material is, is that because when it deforms, it produces cracks, but very, very tiny cracks, these cracks actually can self-heal. The research, originally done by Dr. Victor Lee of the University of Michigan in the late 90s, created a product that was stronger and more durable than concrete, but four times more expensive. Using materials found locally in Louisiana, Arce found a way to lower that cost significantly. And after a couple of months, a year, a year and a half, we were able to find the right materials at the right proportions that actually allows to have a material with very similar properties than Lee's uh, material and at the same time at, at a reduced cost. The new product, named Engineered Cementitious Composite, or ECC for short, is stronger, more durable, and more versatile than regular concrete, and projects will require less of it to complete. You do not require the same quantity of material, so at half the thickness, approximately, this material could potentially perform equally or better than typical concrete. Therefore, the cost uh, levels out. Working together with PhD students such as Hassan Norvand and Ricardo Hungria, as well as Dr. Marwa Hassan, Director of Transportation Consortium of South Central States, or TRANSET, 
Arce is hopeful that the concrete will be available nationwide, and Dr. Hassan says the plans for the ECC are moving along very quickly. Based on the interest that we're getting from stakeholders that are coming up with ideas for different applications from culverts uh, to um, uh, ultra thin layers as an overlay for maintenance of pavement, I think very soon, uh, as long as we keep in touch with uh, our stakeholders and work with them, I think within three to five years. Plans are underway for the bendable concrete to undergo further testing at the LTRC Pavement Research Facility in Port Allen this coming March, where 30 years of wear and tear will be simulated in merely six months. RSA says none of this will be possible without the people at Transit. When we established the center, we focused from the beginning on implementation because a lot of good folks in universities do research that does not reach industry stakeholders in general. So the next time you see that annoying pothole in the road you keep on hitting, think of the incredible work that Gabriel Arce and many others are doing and know that a solution is on the horizon. For Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Charles Jones. Charles, thank you for that bendable concrete. Their research will be on display at a Transet conference in San Antonio in April. And that's our show for this week, everyone. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows and other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Sometimes providing power means lending a hand. So Energy sponsors free tax return assistance and financial education to help our customers take control of their future. Together, we power life. Energy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.